get started. So, some more linear system stuff. <clears throat> Let me just uh, start by reiterating where did I end the last time. So, we will do we will solving linear systems. That means ax equals b, where x is the unknown, b is the noun right hand side, and a in our case is just a n by n, that means square real matrix. And what I was talking about last time was that the standard way of solving a linear system, the Gaussian elimination, is in matrix language. Oops, I should not be writing and talking at the same time. Only. Is equivalent LU decomposition. The difference being that the LU decomposition is like the, the same thing in like the language of matrices, where all, all the steps I capture using matrix, matrix, matrix multiplication. And the L, LU, what, what that means, that means if I have a square matrix A like this, that's my A. Then I decompose it into a product of two matrices. All these decompositions, they deal with products. Where this is a lower triangular. This is upper triangular matrix. So they are, of course, all, all, all the same dimension, or, all, or are, all are here seem to be n by n. So, so this, is, this is what we discussed the last time, how to find these matrices L and U. We find them by doing elementary row operations, which happen to be lower triangle matrices. If we, and we know that if we multiply lower triangle matrices together, we get another lower triangle matrix. And also, if we invert a lower triangular matrix, we get still a lower triangular matrix. That's, that's because inverting every single elementary row operation is easy. And if, if I again multiply them together, I will again get a lower triangular matrix. And the important thing is that there were, there were several cases. The, the most important cases were this A system, AX equals B, this system has exactly one solution, a unique solution. And that you will see if you get a LU decomposition that has all diagonal elements, all these guys on the diagonal are non-zeros, then there is a unique solution because then the back substitutions work perfectly. How do back, sub back substitutions or back and front substitute or forward substitution, how do they work? Well, if I have this AX equals B and I know that A, A is LU, then I, just pl then I know that LU, LUX equals B, right? Then I can say that my UX is going to be a new unknown, like perform like a substitution. And I first solve LY equals B. And once I get the Y, I solve the UX equals Y. And from this, I get the X, which is my, which is my solution. So this is what we talked about last time. And this, these, these systems are simple because they are just triangular. So in this LY case, I'm solving against the lower triangular matrix. So I, I do forward substitution. I first get X1 from, from this equation. Then there are gonna be two things. So I substitute and get, get the last one and so on, and the next one and so on. The same thing for the U, except that here I go from the other, other side, right? Here it's like just one non-zero guy. There's two, there's three. And the point being that the previous ones I've already computed. Okay, so <clears throat> that looks very nice in theory, and then you try to code it up in practice, and you will for your next project. <laughs> then you will find out that there are uh, several problems. Some of them have to do with the fact that, like in MATLAB and, and in many other cases when doing computations on a computer, we are not working with real numbers, really. We are only working with approximations of real numbers. So if you, if you imagine that this is like the, my real line, that's like zero here, and here would be one, here would be minus one. So like any point on this line is a real number, right? 
but the numbers that you can represent in a computer they are they are only some sort of discrete samples there's like a lot of them there but there is only that many and what is what is even more funny that the further away i go the sampling gets uh, larger and larger right when i'm at some really large numbers then these these sticks the 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 real numbers representable in my computer re representation they are getting wider and wider apart and eventually some word has to end right it, it has to be finite so there are some some super large numbers like i cannot represent in a, with the finite number of bits now there are ways how to do exact calculations there might be some of them might be even in matlab definitely maple and software like mathematica they have option to do exact algebra but in practice you almost never want to do that because it gets way slower so it's basically not worth it and this precision if you know what you are doing then this precision is pretty good usually and this is what today's lecture essentially will be about about knowing what you are doing so what can go wrong and how to fix it so you know that typically we have float single precision or double double precision so the float is four bytes four bytes is double which is eight bytes this is this is the case for the eight so six or this is 32 bits this is 64 bits so sometimes if you are in doubt if like your problems can be due to like not enough precision and you can try switching to doubles if you are already in doubles then you, you have a problem because it's not another easy way to switch to higher uh, precision but uh, <coughs> usually the precision is fine if you know what you are doing so let's let's elaborate on that knowing what we are doing in the in the in the case of solving linear systems so we will be i will be demonstrating on the example when we have just three digits of precision just for simplicity all, all these examples would work for like arbitrary precision arithmetic right even if i route like myself 128 bits the point is still the same i only have a finite subset of real numbers to work with so not all all real numbers and i somehow i need to live with it if i want fast cal computations so what does it mean if i allow myself only three digits of precision for each number so i have some exponent that's fine those are like some extra bits but here I can only store three significant digits. So it means that if I'm like adding two things, so this would be 1890, right? 1 1.89 times 1000. And this is 2.01 times one. So like in scientific notation, MATLAB actually sort of likes that too. So if I want to add this, well, first I need to bring it to the same exponent, right? So then I, so I divide this by a thousand so uh, so the exponents match then i can sum it sure that's that's what that's what internally happens in in, in the in the cpu and then then there is the problem then there's the rounding right because i can only keep three significant digits so i keep the three most significant ones so it means that the rest i discard so this is the rounding error that happens there so in this example we lost the entire second number because it was it was basically too small so no, notice that the, the problems are bigger when we when we are dealing with bigger numbers when i was showing the spacing the, the distance between the representable numbers is getting larger larger the further further away you go there's some impacts on like programming i've seen some like game programmers saying like if you have like a level of a game that is like 10 kilometers then don't have like a unit of meter then if something far away would be still in meters and would not be really precise So the, the, the message to remember is these, these things happen and we have to live with them. All the computations in flow or in single or double precision are approximate. And usually the accuracy is pretty good, but no, it's not exact. And sometimes that matters. So w when that matters is when these small errors get amplified and create huge errors. And this is this is also what happens in solving linear systems if you don't know what you are doing. So let's <laughs> let's take a look. 
as an example. <coughs> so here is an example of a sim simple system, just two by two system, so two unknowns, two accurations. The first one has a funny scaling here. So this is some really small number multiplying x. It's like, I think it's like minus 0 0.0001, right? And to minus four. And if you if you if you solve if you compute the solution, then this is the solution. So this is the exact solution. So roughly x both x and y are roughly one, right? Plus plus some plus some tiny tiny thing, which sort sort of makes sense, right? This this x was this multiplied by something really small, so like almost zero. So you can easily verify immediately that almost one almost one like almost satisfies these equations. Now let's take a look what happens if we just blindly apply Gaussian elimination as I was describing it uh, the last time or LU decomposition. So what do, we, what do we do if we are doing Gaussian elimination? So we have a system like this. Ah, never mind. So I have a system like this. So the, the, the recipe in Gaussian elimination is to take the first equation, scale it in such a way that when, when added to the second equation, the first term, the, the x in the second equation disappears. So I need to scale this by, so times 10 to four. So that will give me what? That will give me minus x plus 10 to four y equals 10 to four. Right, which means in case I'm doing some mistake, so that's that's scaled, and now I need to add this this to the second equation. So if I do that, I get x minus x. That's zero. That's what I wanted, and I have ten to the four plus one, and on the right hand side, ten to four plus two. So that's that's this. That's scaling the first equation by ten to four and adding it to the second equation. So I get this. Now, unfortunately, the rounding kicks in because I'm only allowing myself three digits of precision. Then this 10 to 4, the 10,000, gets rounded to only 10,000. It's like a small error, small rounding error happens there, right? The same way 10,000 10, plus 2, well, that only gets rounded to 10,000 because that's all the precision I have. So that means that after rounding, the, f the first equation here I just copied, Not nothing, nothing happened to it. But this, this one, after rounding, became this one. This, this one and two was, was forgotten, was lost in, in, the, in the rounding process due to, due to limited precision. And now if I do back substitution, what I, what I find out, I find out that y is one, that's fine. But when I plug, the, plug it here, I get y is one, so it's zero. So x is also zero from this. So I get this solution x1 y1 and that's bad right because the the right solution was something like almost one for x and almost one for y right so this is not even approximately correct answer right i would take one and one for an answer because that's fine i have fi finite i have limited precision so probably the answer will not be perfectly correct that's fine but it but if it's like completely off that's that's bad, right? Because when I when I try to substitute to the original system, it does not. It, the, the second the second equation is not satisfied even approximately. So this is an example of of the problem that like small rounding a really really tiny, see, see seemingly innocent rounding errors, uh, could amplify it and created a big big error at the end. So fortunately, there is a relatively simple solution. By the way, you could also notice that in case this was this was completely zero, the first equation was just y equals one, so there was no x in it, x in it, then it couldn't work, right? That would be it would be even like more even bigger problem. Even if it had like infinite precision arithmetic, then I still couldn't do it. I couldn't eliminate the, the x from the second equation using the first equation that has zero x to begin with. Divide by zero. 
So the solution to this problem, both, both the factual problem when there is exactly zero, or the numerical problem when there is approximately almost zero, something very small, it's, it's almost zero, is called partial pivoting. Actually, maybe, maybe you, could, you could think about it, actually. What, what, what would you do <laughs> before I tell you what to do? So the trick is essentially to reorder the computations. Yeah, so the problem uh, in the previous example was that there was like a really tiny piv pivot element with which we, we had to divide, right? It was the 10, 10 point minus 10 to the minus four, like 0 0.0001. So when we divided with it, we created some huge numbers which were added to some small numbers and then these small numbers were, were completely forgotten and uh, we, we, we got completely wrong answer at the end. So if we arrange things so that, such that we use the, the, the largest magnitude pivot for elimination, this problem will uh, go away. And we can arrange this by swapping the rows of the matrix. Or if we are looking at a, s a system of equations, we can switch the order of equations, the order in which, uh, which, we, which we are listing the equations, or also the order in which we are eliminating them. So specifically, a good idea is, uh, the idea of partial pivoting is to use as the first equation the one that has the, the maximum pivot. Because if, if uh, so like in the matrix, it means like if, if I'm, if I'm, if I have some uh, number here and I'm trying to eliminate all these numbers with A, then the idea is to get this A to be the maximum of all these guys here. Because when it is, I will not have to be scaling it up, I will only need to be scaling it down, right? Because if, if A is bigger than like, maybe I can call it like A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, there would be some honor. This is like my matrix. If A1 is greater or equal than all the uh, AIs, then it means that I will only need to scale the first equation down, right? So multiply it by something, by a number from this interval, in minus one to one. So I'll only be scaling it down. So that's, that, that will be good because I will, not be, I will not be creating some large numbers by potentially, by having a small pivot there and having to scale it up. So in the previous example, all we have to do is swap the order of equations and I will show you that this really solves the, solves the problem. And this is what is called partial, partial pivoting. So this is not, not like, not, not complete answer to all the problems, but it's a very important first step. So let's take a look what happens when I do that, when I swap the order of the two equations. So previously I had, so previously this, this one was first and this one was second. Now I flipped it, so this one goes first, and this one goes second. So notice that here the pivot element here, the coefficient of x is just one, right? So that's, that's the bigger element here, and the small one goes here. So when I'm doing a Gaussian elimination here, what I need to do is I need to multiply this, this by 10 to four, uh, minus four. So I get 10 to minus four x plus 10 to minus four y equals two times 10 to minus four. and then I add it to the second equation. So the x cancels, right? That's what I wanted. And I get 10 to minus four plus one. That's, that's this thing. And here I get two times 10 to minus four plus one. So that's this thing, right? So the rounding still has to happen. I, I'm only, I'm like simulating finite precision arithmetic with only three digits of precision. So these things again get rounded. Right, so here, here this one, uh, sorry, this, this is like almost nothing, right? This is point zero point zero 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 one. So this gets rounded to one. 
and the same same thing here this is like 0 0.0002 so after rounding this will be only one so after rounding that the first equation is the same same and the second one is just one y equals one one times y so just y equals one and now if i do the back substitution i'm much more happy because i get y is one that's already written here right and if i substitute this here it says x plus one is two so x must be one All right and this is x x equal one y equal one is a result i'm happy with it's not the exact answer because it can be because i don't have infinite precision but it's it's an answer very close to the correct one right which was something like one like z 0 0.999 or something something like that so it was very, very very close to this so this par partial pivoting did, did the trick and would also solve the case if there was like exactly zero so if if this the same basically was not there that that would that would basically that this would already be triangle system in this case but if it was a like if, if the, it was a larger system and I had some zero elements, that would, that's what I would have to do to actually be able to compute the LU decomposition or apply Gaussian elimination. Right, these two things are equivalent. Okay. <coughs> Fortunately, this is not, not the end. So you can probably guess by the name partial pivot thing. This is just the beginning, just the first part. There is another problem which is related but uh, different. So let's take a look at this system. You can see that the pivots here are pretty much okay. It's minus 10 and 1. So there's not, not, no such thing like two huge pivot or something like that. And it turns out that this system also has a solution which is like almost one, not exactly one, but the exact solution, right? Let's see if it's correct. So there is some huge number here. So yeah, if, if this is one, so this, this plays no role, this is too small. And this is one, roughly one plus roughly one is roughly two, right? So this seems to work. So let's take a look if we do Gaussian elimination on this system, what happens? And again, we are using the finite precision arithmetics, just three digits of precision. Okay, so the same thing. So I need to multiply the first equation by 10 to minus one, so times 10 to minus one. So I eliminate this x, so that gives me minus x plus 10 to 4 y equals 10 to 4 and I add it to the second equation so x disappears here I get 10 to 4 plus 1 and 10 to 4 plus 2 that's gonna be the right hand side now you know the drill now the rounding kicks in and the 10 to the 4 plus 1 is rounded just to 10 to the 4 and then to four plus two is uh, rounded again, just to 10, 10 to four. So if I uh, write down the, the resulting system, I get this. And we are again running into problems, you can see, because now back substitution gives me y equal one. And if I plug the y equal one here, I get minus 10 x equals zero. That means that x is zero. That's again far from the true answer. Now this time, this time the problem is not the pivots. The pivots are uh, well behaved. The problem is though still with these these large numbers there being mixed with small numbers, right? Uh, these these ten to fives are basically causing causing the problem. So what we can do about this? There's uh, several strategies. The simplest thing we can do is row scaling. And the idea is basically simple. We, we s simply divide every equation by the coefficient of maximum magnitude. 
So maximum magnitude means uh, we, we, we took, we look at the coefficients in absolute values. So it doesn't matter if it's like a, a huge positive number or a huge negative number, it just, what just matters is huge. So I look, look at the absolute value and the absolute value, uh, and I pick the, in, in each row, I pick the coefficient with the largest magnitude and I can divide the entire equation with it, right? It has no effect on the solution. I, of course, can scale every equation by anything that's not zero. But it has a, a numerical effect. So if I had the minus 10x plus 10 to 5y equals 10 to 5, then I take, so the maximum magnitude element is 10 to 5, right? So I can divide everything, divide, by 10 to 5 or multiply by 10 to minus 5 so here I get minus 10 to minus 4 x plus y equals 1 right so this is this is the scaling of that row to get rid of this huge number here which was the troublemaker so if, if I apply it to the system we had there before so the that, so that's that's what I do to the first equation the second equation stays unchanged that's still x plus y equals 2 so this, just the first row was scaled. And now partial pivoting will work. Partial pivoting will now tell me that I need to reorder these equations and will solve it and, and will give me approximately the right answer. So this is like a second numerical trick, which is used to get, get around these uh, numerical or around rounding issue problems. <laughs> The row scaling does not solve, still still does not solve all problems, <laughs> because sometimes we need also column scaling. This actually occurs in practice quite quite a lot. If you are like solving some system which came from some physical, like from some measurements or something like that, <coughs> then sometimes it can happen that like your unknowns have some have some physical interpretation. That they might also have like units, like volts or milliampères or meters or, or kilograms or, or, or whatever. And sometimes it can be that like the, the, the magnitudes in each of these unknowns varies drastically. That like some, some like X1 or X can be like in the units of like easily can be thousands and tens of thousands and Y can be like usually like something below one or something like that, something really small. And that you you know already that's that's not numerically good, right? I guess it's it's from 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 the intuition of like how how the number how the floating point numbers are represented in a computer that like around zero and close to one I have like a lots lots of precision, but the further I go the less precision I have, right? And ultimately I, when I go to like really huge number I I completely ru run out <laughs> of, of my of my numbers. So basically the point, so if this is like zero. The point is that you want to rescale things that you are working with numbers of about the same magnitude. And one way you can think about it, and in terms of matrices, you can think about it as scaling columns, but maybe for more, more intuitive thing is if I have some variables x, y, and so on, then I could introduce substitutions simply. Right. Instead of working with x, I can work with x prime, which is, for example, I don't know, thousand x, right? And maybe y, y prime will be like 0 0.001 times y. And then I will, then I will solve the system in x primes and y primes, do a substitution. That's that's the same thing as we were doing during during the LU decomposition, right? Remember, this y was like a substitution essentially. Then I solve the system in these x primes and y primes, and one, and then then trivially come back, and the solution will be more accurate because I rescale things that I am adding roughly uh, the numbers of roughly the same magnitude. That's 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 the idea. In terms of matrices, you can look at it as scaling of columns. Uh, another alternative to this is also doing uh, a column reordering. Because what you can also do, 
you can also do in the so if I have a matrix oh, let me do it properly two one and one and here is here is some other stuff but I don't I don't care what that is so by reordering rows I can make sure that a11 is greater or equal than a oops a i1 for i greater or equal than 2 right and if i allow myself to also sw swap columns then i can make sure that this a11 is going to be the biggest of all these all these a's here oh sorry this should have been a1n so that a11 will also be bigger than a one i for i greater than equal than two. That's another way how to make sure uh, things things will work well. That's uh, column column reordering. So this uh, this reordering of rows is actually interesting. Uh, what is interesting is that we can again explain it or completely describe it in matrix language. And the trick there is permutation matrices. So this will be like another useful matrix to your arsenal of matrices. <coughs> These things are super useful to know when uh, doing things in MATLAB. Because MATLAB is very good at doing all, 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 thing, all things in matrices, so if you can formulate your problem or your operation for some matrices, MATLAB will be very happy about it and will give you the solution quickly. So permutation matrices are essential the matrix counterpart to to, uh, to permuting rows, to, to exchanging rows. And so what, what is a permutation matrix? I could write it schematically as, how would I write it? 0, 1 to n by n. The idea means that this is a binary matrix. It's a matrix, n by n matrix, that has only zeros or ones in it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a special subset of all matrices that not, not all uh, real numbers are allowed, but only zero or one is allowed. And there is another condition. So I'll write it here. Only zero and one allowed. And on top of it, everywhere have to be zeros, except in every row and column, there has to be exactly one one. So maybe it's better to give you like an example. So a three by three example, for instance, this would be a permutation matrix. So every row and column, exactly one, one, and the rest has to be zeros. I'd like a five by five permutation matrix. So like, if you know, like in the game of chess, those would be, how is it called, this, this piece? The tower, right? So I, I, I have to place n towers on the checkerboard so that they are not, yeah. how is it called, when they are like attacking each other? I'm blanking on the word right now. Huh? They, are, they are not in check, yeah. So this is like a valid configuration of towers on the checkerboard. <laughs> yep. So is that condition just an example of a permutation matrix, or is it a condition for all? This is for all. This, this, so, so, any perm, so permutation matrix is defined as a matrix that has only zeros and ones in it. And in every row and every column, there has to be exactly one one. And n minus one zeros, obviously. So this is, this is a definition of a permutation matrix. So um, what does a permutation matrix do if I apply it to some other matrix? So this is a, a whole row, A1, A2. So those are three rows of a three by three matrix. So this is also like a three by three matrix. This is the three by three permutation matrix. This is a three by three arbitrary matrix. And see what the matrix multiplication does here. So this does... Uh, this takes zero and multiplies with the first row, one with the second row, and zero with the third row. So the first row is going to be A2 here, right? 
The second row, I take this vector here and I multiply with the matrix, so I get A1. <coughs> and the last one, 0, 0, 1, so here I get A3. So this matrix, what, what it happened to do was just flip, switch the first two rows, right? So this is, this is what this permutation matrix does. So this is exactly what I need to do when I'm doing the row reordering, the partial pivoting. It can be expressed as multiplication with the permutation matrix. So permutation matrices are, are sort of beautiful. They have lots of nice properties. The one property you can immediately see from the definition, so this is the definition, you can also see it from this example, is do you, it's something we th thought about in relation to rotation matrices. Remember like the two by two rotation, the cosine signs, and I was saying it's very, very cool because uh, these matrices are orthonormal because the length of every column or every row is one and if I take two columns or two rows and their dot product is zero so they are, they are orthogonal, that's a 90 degrees angle between the two vectors so they are, these are also or orthonormal matrices so permutation matrices are an example of orthonormal matrices but not all orthonormal matrices have to be permutation matrices right? like rotations are not obviously because generally they have different numbers than zero and one of course uh, if i take two permutation matrices p1 and p2 their product is again a permutation matrix it's because the composition of permutations is another permutation Now, what would happen if I applied the, if I multiplied some matrix with the permutation matrix from the right? What do you think would happen? Yeah, if you can like imagine, uh, let, let, let me try to write it up. So now I will strategically write these as column vectors. I, I take the same matrix and see what happens. So here I get A2, A1, and A3, right? Everybody sees that? If I do this matrix multiple, so these are like three column vectors here, I have three row vectors. It's probably just the way how I'm looking at the matrix, right? This is absolutely arbitrary matrix. I'm just trying to interpret what this multiplication does. So here, here you can see what does it do if I multiply with the permutation matrix from the right. I permute the columns. So here you can also see another reminder that matrix multiplication is of not commutative because it matters if I multiply from the left or from the right, right? Multiplying from the left permutes rows, multiplying from the right permutes columns. So uh, the partial pivoting, uh, the, so the, the statement I can make about partial pivoting or uh, LU decomposition is that if I have a matrix A, which is an N by N matrix, then there always exists a permutation matrix P. I'll call it like perm N, such that PA equals LU where L is lower triangular and U is upper triangular. I'm not gonna be repeating it all the time. So what this means, so um, LU decomposition would not have to exist in general. You could run into it, as I, as I said, right? If in the first equation, your X has coefficient of zero, then I cannot proceed. I can proceed if I permute rows, if I allow myself to permute the rows of, a, of the matrix A. So for any matrix A, I can find the permutation matrix and I can fi find a lower triangle matrix L and upper triangle matrix U such that this decomposition applies. So that this, this equation is true, that B times A is L times U. And this is, this is also the partial pivoting in, in matrix language. Now, 
you can probably guess now what would be full pivoting. Full pivoting means that I also allow myself to switch columns. So then I have P1 and P2, permutation matrices, and the full pivoting looks like this. So it permutes both rows and columns by different permutation matrices and gives me uh, also a LU decomposition. So in MATLAB, you don't have to call this up if you didn't have a project for that, <laughs> because in MATLAB it already is implemented. The LU routine can also return you the permutation it used for partial pivoting. That this this pivoting things are are pretty much standard in, in the Miracle software because without a pivoting it doesn't really work, as, as you have seen from the examples before. And the permutation is nothing special; it just means reorder the rows of the matrix. So there is uh, <coughs> now you know. Now you know all about the uh, numerical issues, rounding, rounding errors. And there is one more catch, which is a little bit more fundamental. Because that's something I cannot solve just by reordering things, or just by like doing computational numerical tricks to, to get to give me to buy me more precision. Because this is this is a fundamental problem. And the problem is that even for some very innocent looking matrices, like matrix like this, all the coefficients are nice, right? They are they are like pretty small numbers, so I should have like enough precision everywhere. They are they are not even not even negative. So this matrix looks pretty innocent. Yet what happens is that the system with this matrix, so the matrix times x the ax equals b is super sensitive to small changes in B. So if I use this as B, then my solution is one and minus one. You can verify that in MATLAB if, if you want. But if I perturb the B just a tiny bit, instead of 168, uh, no, sorry, instead of the 67, I just use 66. That's, that's the only difference here. The matrix is the same. The, only the right hand side changes just by a tiny bit. I get totally different solution. And this is something you cannot weasel out of. That's basic, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, the problem is in the matrix in the case, in, in this case. There's no permutations that, 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 that would fix it because the problem is, is inherent to, to the matrix. The problem is that the matrix is poorly conditioned. So that's what like numerical people call it. And uh, it essentially is the same thing as dividing by some really small number. It's, it's something like in, in the scalar case, it would be something like if you had like an equation, like this, just a scalar one. So if here was something like really small, right? In, in, in this case, when I change B slightly, then I can expect huge changes in X, right? Because I, I divide by this, so I magnify whatever small changes were there by a lot, right? Now in the scalar case, it's, it's super obvious, right? Because here you like obviously see, ah, here is something small. So I'll be dividing by something small and, and that should like trigger that red flag. Ah, that's, that's, that's bad, right? Now the, the catch is that in matrices, it can be hidden. You might not see it immediately. This matrix looks pretty innocent, but it has this 0 0.0001 buried in it. It, it is, it is in, in that matrix. And later, later, later in this course, we will discuss techniques how to actually analyze the matrix so we can tell if it's well conditioned or poorly conditioned, such as this matrix. And there, there is a way to, to look at, uh, it's called singular values of the matrix, uh, singular value decomposition, which will reveal the fact that this matrix has some like has some really small numbers hidden in it essentially. That's the, that's the intuitive explanation of that.
Yeah, so I guess the message is that there are uh, some problems due to rounding errors and we can get around these problems by just reordering in a smart way our computations. And then there are some problems which are essentially due to the fact that the matrices are close to singular. Which means that then the solution is very sensitive to small perturbation of the right hand sides. And the only way to deal with it is by changing the matrix or changing your model. Permutations are not going to help in that case. Yeah, and MATLAB solving linear systems is nothing, nothing simpler than that. There's the magical MATLAB backslash operator, and I shall told you about it. It even works for like rectangular matrices, so, so it does more than we discussed here. But for uh, square matrices, it does all, all the tricks we talked about here. There is like a whole uh, technology of these linear solvers. So uh, in this in this lecture, you basically saw like the basics, what sort of issues you need to deal with when you are constructing a linear system solver. And that's like the, the tip of the iceberg. Basically. So implementing the Gaussian elimination and Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting will be the topic of the next project, but then again, I will uh, assign it on Friday when like your previous project is, is due. The next thing I will show you, but probably more on a Friday than today, will be some examples of li linear systems. Oh wait, oh, sorry. one some examples of linear systems just just to just to give you some more concrete idea of like what what these what solving linear systems can be good for you might not take my word for it that it appears over and over again in like computer science and engineering so uh, here will be some specific examples probably doesn't make sense to go into them in detail now, but well, maybe I can do the simplest one 1D interpolation. So, here uh, I assume we are just in 1D, and I have some measurements at some points, some x1 to they can be sp space whatever x3 and x4 there I have some measurements y1 y2 y3 and y4 and I want to interpolate this I'm saying like, that's great that I have the measurements here but I, I would really want to have some values like in between so I would like to fit it some something some smooth curve smooth function that would interpolate these values. The, sim the simplest function I can fit to it is a polynomial. If I have four values then it's a good idea to fit it a degree three polynomial because then the number of degrees of freedom of the polynomial will match the number of my observations. So I'll get a square linear system which is exactly what we were just talking about how to how to solve that. And the cool thing is that <coughs> even though I have these, these non-linear non terms here, like the xi to the power of 3, 2, and 2, this, this will still be linear, so that's okay. Then I can easily solve this just using a linear system. Uh, this, this is, don't, the, the point is that you should not get scared away by this xi cube. That's because the xi's are the points where I am measuring, so those are then those are not unknowns. The xi's and yi's are knowns. And the unknowns are only a, b, c, and d. Those are the coefficients of my polynomial. So what I'm solving for here, what the unknowns are, is the a, b, c, and d. And I know the uh, yi's and the xi's. Those are, those are my measurements. What I don't know is how this curve looks like, and the curve is described by these a, b, c, and d. And 
the, and the task is for the given x i's and y i's, I want to find these a, b, c, d's, right? So I have four equations, if I have four, four measurements, and the equations can be written in matrix form, form like this. This is the first row is saying that uh, at x1 I have the value y1, the second row says the same thing for x2, for x3 and x4. And this is an example of a square linear system which we can solve and get the values a, b, c, d. And we have our interpolating polynomial. So that's example number one. There is more examples coming. And we'll talk about them on Friday. Okay? <laughs> Any questions? Okay. So in that case, thank you. I'll see you on Friday.